On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, John Stossel thinks the Jones Act makes shipping more expensive. We better call Sal. I'm the aforementioned Sal McCoglano. Welcome to this episode. So I was filming a video today. I had a great video going on when all of a sudden my phone, social media blew up. I think there was a bat signal outside the window saying that John Stossel just dropped a video about the Jones Act. And of course I had to stop everything, watch it, review it. And now I'm gonna do a reaction to that video. If you wanna see the original video, link down below in the show notes and you'll see the link to it if you wanna get John's unabridged version. If you want the abridged version, then hang on tight because we're gonna do it right now here. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's go ahead and see what John Stossel has to say about the Jones Act. So this is John's website here. He has a huge YouTube channel, no idea. I didn't realize. I, I grew up watching John Stossel on 2020 and his reports. I guess now he does this YouTube channel with over almost 800,000 subscribers. Very jealous, John, uh, 10 times what I got. Uh, but uh, I, John is a very libertarian type guy that believes in small government. So obviously the Jones Act is a topic that he is not going to enjoy. I, 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 I can see that now. All right, let's go ahead and jump into this video. Disaster in Puerto Rico. Storm after storm, Puerto Rico desperately needs supplies. Over 60% of the island is still without power. After Hurricane Fiona, Puerto Rico needed fuel. Yet right offshore, within sight of land, was this tanker. Okay, uh, this story is one that I covered in a lot of detail when it was happened. I did actually a pair of videos on this topic right here you'll see and i'll have it linked in the show notes below where i address this tanker understand this is a huge issue that went on at the time because onshore there was fuel in the ports there was diesel fuel there was all the supplies needed for the hurricane but an energy company and a tank tanker company wanted to make it look like there wasn't and that's what causes this issue that john is delving into now carrying a full load of fuel, but the U.S. government forbade it to come ashore. For days, it just sat here while people suffered. Long lines for diesel, long lines for gasoline. Why didn't they let the ship deliver its fuel? Because of a stupid law with a stupid name, the Jones Act. Okay, uh, I, I'm not sure what the name of the law has to do with it. I can come up with a lot of stupid name laws, but all right, let's go ahead and let me continue here in a minute. And I'm gonna jump in here. It restricts domestic shipping to vessels that are U.S. built and U.S. crewed. Because this ship was registered in the Marshall Islands, it wasn't allowed to bring its fuel ashore. Okay, let, let's break this down a little bit, what John is talking about here. This story, and again, I covered this in detail and actually talked to people on the ground. So this tanker was chartered by an oil company and arrived off the southern coast of Puerto Rico right after Hurricane Fiona hit. Now, because it is a Marshall Island flag vessel, it was not allowed to land its cargo under the Jones Act, which basically, as you just saw, says you cannot land cargo from one U.S. port into another U.S. port unless the ship is U.S. owned, U.S. flagged, U.S. crewed, and U.S. built. And a couple of things. Number one, the issue here wasn't diesel fuel in the ports. All right, go watch those videos. I talked to people on the ground. A buddy of mine runs a YouTube channel, Tim B at Sea. I just did an interview with him the other day. And Tim runs a tug and barge around Puerto Rico. It's literally what he does. He moves fuel <clears throat> from port to port around Puerto Rico. And he reported that the port in southern Puerto Rico was full of fuel. There was not an issue with getting fuel into Puerto Rico. The problem was getting fuel out of the ports into the interior of Puerto Rico and around the island because the inland distribution system in Puerto Rico, the power generation system is in poor repair. And that was the issue. It wasn't the arrival of fuel in the ports. There was plenty of fuel in the ports. This was an opportunity by this shipping company and this oil company to dump a load of fuel loaded in the Gulf of Mexico into Puerto Rico, go back, get another load, and then transport it and make double the profit. That's what was going on here in this story, specifically that John is referencing. It wasn't a fact that there was diesel shortages caused by the lack of diesel being shipped into the island. All right, so now I know where he's coming from with this story. Your rules really hurt people. They don't. What the Jones Act does 
is ensure reliable, dedicated service. Jennifer Carpenter speaks for the American Maritime Partnership. They represent ship owners, builders, and labor unions. They demand that the government forbid these efficient foreign ships from competing with American ships. Okay, well, a couple of word choices there. Number one, demand. This is the law. It is the law since 1920. The stupid name he gives is actually the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. This was a law that was passed right after World War I, where the United States found itself in a position where it did not have enough international shipping to haul its cargoes. Hence, one of the provisions, again, this is Section 27 of an act that has 32 provisions, says that we shall have a domestic merchant marine to haul cargo between U.S. ports under those four criteria I mentioned before. The other thing he says is the efficient foreign carriers, I, where have he been for the past two years? Has he not watched my channel? Hello? Have you not watched what's going on with shipping? It's not exactly been the most efficient shipping by the foreign carriers. I, I tend to remember 109 ships anchored off of LA and Long Beach. But anyway, I, I, I digress. Let John continue. And politicians obey. My strong support for the Jones Act. When the Jones Act strangles places, reporters often ask. Why not lift the Jones Act? And I'd really love if reporters, instead of just asking the question, researched behind the thing. Because if John had done what you know I just said, he would have realized that that tanker sitting off the southern co coast of Puerto Rico was not needed at the time, just like we did at the time on this channel, where we investigated it, found out how much oil was on the ground, diesel on the ground, and realized that this tanker was not necessary to come in, especially when there were other tankers scheduled to come in, thanks to the Jones Act, which dedicates ships to that specific trade. Even tough guy politicians hesitate. But we have a lot of shippers and a lot of people and a lot of uh, people that work in the shipping industry that don't want the Jones Act lifted. So basically, you're giving money to politicians and they ban your competition. Uh, again, lobbyists do this in every industry around. But OK, John's just realizing now what lobbyists do. The Jones Act is a time tested American security law. So we are not at the mercy of foreign powers, foreign vessels, foreign mariners. And again, that goes back to the origination of this law, because in 1914, when World War I was declared, most of our shipping, international shipping, was done by foreign ships. We had the third largest merchant marine in the world behind Great Britain and Germany. But when World War I was declared, those ships vacated the seas. They had a focus on supporting their allies. They had to uh, flee the high seas, not to get captured, the Germans. And fortunately, we had a large domestic fleet that was able to transition into the international role. And that's why post-World War I, we put that as a provision of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, which was a holistic national maritime strategy. It wasn't just this one section. It included international shipping. It included foreign trade. It included shipbuilding. It included government oversight. It, it dealt with rates. Uh, when we saw those huge spikes in rates during the supply chain crisis, that was dealt with under the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, but it's been repealed through provisions in 1980 and 1990s. So again, this is a, a, a key element here is that this shipping act was a national maritime strategy, but over the past 103 years, we've slowly dismantled it. We use foreign mariners and foreign vessels every day. Hey, it's Scott. It's Scott Linscombe. Scott Linscombe is over at the Cato Institute. And Scott is a buddy of mine. I say that absolutely uh, uh, falsely, let me be clear. So I have tried to have discussions with Scott Linscombe about the Jones Act. Uh, Cato Institute is a lobby group, a think tank that basically has made its mark in arguing against the Jones Act. They actually have one employee, Colin Gabrow, who's hired to do nothing but oppose the Jones Act. And Scott and I have, have been unable to connect recently, largely because Scott has blocked me <laughs> on Twitter. And not because I am rude. If anyone who follows me and knows me knows I'm very civilized. Uh, I love having a good, vibrant discussion. It's just that I disagree with Scott's position on the Jones Act. And because I disagreed with him and I'd post information contrary to what he was saying, Scott blocked me. So I guess libertarians believe in free trade, just not free speech. So anyway, let's let Scott talk, unlike something he would allow me to do. Cato Institute trade specialist Scott Linsicum points out that foreign vessels travel to America all the time. Here they are one recent day, crowding into New York Harbor. It is only in shipping between American ports 
that we don't allow for those vessels. Think about And again, go back to the reason. Why is that, Scott? Why is it we don't allow that? And again, one of the things you're not going to hear in this entire discussion by John Stossel is the issue of national security and how important it is for the United States, which has the largest economy in the world, which has a huge military and economic overseas presence, to have a domestic shipping industry that's used not just for the transportation of our domestic goods, but also for supporting the U.S. military in the, in the guise of sea lift. Foreign ships can deliver from China to America, Russia to America. Actually, Russia can't right now because of sanctions. But not from Seattle to Alaska, Los Angeles to Hawaii, Miami to Puerto Rico. You may also want to add in there uh, among the Great Lakes on the inland waterway system of the Mississippi River along the U.S. coast, the Staten Island Ferry. All of those fall under Jones Act provisions. That's illegal? I asked the lobbyists, why couldn't desperate Puerto Ricans get this fuel, which was right offshore? Okay, I asked the lobbyist, obviously using the, the not the American Maritime Partnership, but the lobbyist, he asked. Again, you know, it's how you ask these questions at times. But again, fuel not needed ashore, that fuel wasn't needed, the tanks on shore were full in the ports. Matter of fact, my buddy Tim B at C talked about the fact that when he went into this port, he couldn't offload his barge entirely. And he had to take part of that barge up to San Juan, which is really dangerous. A half loaded barge full of fuel is one of the most dangerous things in the world. There was a U.S. flag ship en route to Puerto Rico. But the U.S. ship wasn't there yet. But it provides dedicated service. Understand if fuel was dependent on foreign shipping, that ship that arrived off the port of Puerto Rico, off the southern port of Puerto Rico down there, that ship wouldn't be there if it could sell that fuel for more money at a different port. U.S. ships are dedicated. These ships will come to U.S. ports because they are on routine service and they are dedicated to it, which means that you are insured shipments. This is what makes Puerto Rico different than the Dominican Republic, Jamaica, and a lot of other islands in the Caribbean in that you'll see shelves stocked all the time because ships are not basically flaking out and going to different ports depending on the market the free market that they're advocating here the jones act ensures a dedicated service carpenter mocks the foreign competitor who got there first foreign oil trader that thought they could make a quick buck by using a foreign ship instead there was no shortage of fuel on puerto rico exactly. but there was no, there was a shortage of diesel in the island, but not in the port, John. Again, you have to differentiate. You have to sit there and understand that the port had the diesel. It was the inland distribution system that was suffering. There is a fuel shortage that is keeping most generators from helping. Puerto Rico's governor begged the Biden administration to waive the Jones Act. What's the governor of Puerto Rico going to do? You will no longer be the governor of Puerto Rico if you don't come out against the Jones Act because of the narrative that is created in Puerto Rico against it. And the bureaucrats finally did. The Biden administration has moved to allow a non-U.S. flagged ship to transport fuel to Puerto Rico. Alejandro Mayorkas, the Secretary of Homeland Security, is the one who granted the waiver. And again, the Department of Homeland Security granting the waiver is a big problem, in my opinion. Where was the United States Maritime Administration under the Secretary of Transportation? It is the Maritime Administration who should have been on the ground determining whether or not a waiver was justified. Understand, this company did not ask for the waiver until the tanker arrived off the port. They arrived off the port on this opportune lift. They fed this to the media. The media ran with it because here's this tanker loaded with diesel, that's the problem when, again, they were not doing the investigation they should have done. We're not blocking needed supplies. The main thing the Jones Act does is make Americans pay more for things. The Jones Act costs the average Hawaii family about $1,800 a year. Okay, you live in Hawaii, in an island in the middle of the Pacific. It's going to be expensive to live there. Uh, again, go to Scott Linscombe, who works for the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C., and you know, if you oppose the Jones Act, maybe you guys should hire, I don't know, a lobby firm in the Philippines, in India, in Indonesia, in China, or Russia, because that's where most mariners come from. I mean, you can pay very little and get a ton of lobbyists. The shipping firms, international shipping firms, just fought, fought against a pay raise 
minimum wage for mariners at sea, the minimum wage now for mariners is a little bit over $21 a day. That's it, $21 a day, and they fought that. So yeah, it's kind of hard to compete against foreign shippers who use crews from those five countries versus the United States. But again, you get dedicated service to the United States ports. Did banning foreigners at least do good things for America's shipbuilding industry? No. America to build the largest fleet of cargo ships ever to sail the seven seas. 50 years ago, America built about 18 ships every year. Last year, just one. Okay. 80 years ago, we had the largest merchant marine in the world as a result of the Jones Act through the United States Maritime Commission building 5,777 ships during World War II that carried the arsenal of democracy from the United States to the war front. At the end of World War II, we carried 63% of all the world's cargo. And what did we do with that? Did we keep ourselves on top and tell everybody, you know, you know, the heck with you, we're going to remain dominant? No. What we did is in 1946, the Ship Sales Act, where we sold 1,113 ships at loss to the United States government so that our allied merchant marines can restock themselves, our allies restock themselves with ships. Through the Marshall Plan, we allowed shipyards around the world to rebuild from our closing shipyards. We basically packed up those prefabricated systems that we had developed in the United States and sent them to Europe, sent them to Japan, and now, China, Japan, Korea build 94% of the world ships. China builds more than China, uh, Korea and Japan combined, about 47% of the world's ships. We did that as part of the Cold War, as part of our effort to rebuild the world economy. And our merchant marine and our maritime industrial base has suffered for that. America's fleet once had 250 ships, now 90. There were once more than 400 American shipyards. 300 are now gone. Okay, this is a international issue. This isn't just the United States. There was a report in Splash 24-7 not too long ago talking about the fact that since 2009, 40% of world shipyards have closed from over 300 down to just over 100. Uh, we're seeing consolidation in the shipyards around the world. This is not unique to the United States. And this is the other element I have with this problem. It's like the Jones Act is the responsible for causing all this problem. Great Britain, France, the Netherlands, Italy, Germany, and I could list you a ton of other countries don't have the Jones Act, yet their merchant fleets are smaller than ours. What caused their fleets to decline? And again, there are a lot of issues at play that have declined the U.S. merchant marine. If you just look at the Jones Act, the creation of the interstate highway system, the interstate pipeline system, uh, intercontinental aircraft, jet aircraft, moving passengers off rail, freeing up rail space for freight, all of that contributed to that. And the fact that we subsidize interstate highways, that our gas and diesel prices are a lot lower than other countries around the world, incentivize moving cargo on land versus by sea. That's the big detriment. And then when you add containerization to it, then it becomes really expensive to move these containers on and off ports. You have a dec decrease in the number of ports around the United States. They consolidate. All those factors contribute to this. It's not just the Jones Act. Because of your monopoly, American shipyards keep closing. They don't have any competition, so they don't improve. Competition within our industry and with other modes of transportation is vigorous. It is dog eat dog. No, it's not because the best dogs are banned. The U.S. government is not subsidizing U.S. shipyards in the way that many of our strategic competitors and allies are doing. Okay, that's true. And it's good that America gives out fewer subsidies. But you need to look at those subsidies, John. It, you're, you're a libertarian. You're, you're sitting there going, I, I, I want to get rid of government oversight. However, shipping deals on an international level. And you can't ignore what is going on. Uh, there was a CSIS report, Hidden Harbors, which documented that China contributed $132 billion, $132 billion between 2010 and 2018 to their shipbuilding. That's a massive amount of money. In that same period, the United States, through their Title 11 shipbuilding loans at the Maritime Administration, provided a whopping total of 77, not billion, but million. That is a fraction of a percent what the U.S. provided. How do you compete with countries like Japan, Korea, and China that overly subsidize 
their industry. Uh, Korea just announced $2 billion in shipbuilding uh, subsidies, and Korea is allowing foreign workers to come in because they can pay them cheaper to work in their shipyards. And again, what we're seeing is a consolidation. China is growing faster and faster in its shipbuilding industry. It now controls 47% of ship construction in the world, and it's only getting bigger. You see Japan on the prospect of collapsing in shipbuilding, leaving just two, a duopoly, in building ships. But foreign subsidies are only a small part of why American ships are so much more expensive four to five times more expensive to build a ship in the United States than to do so in a place like Japan or Korea or in our NATO ally country. Can't help that Scott leaves out China on that one. And Scott, show your math on this, because again, if you think you're getting an accurate cost to build a ship in Japan, Korea, or China, uh, you're wrong because they are not showing the true cost. How much is a day worker in China? How much is Korea paying because they're bringing in foreign ship Builders. And while you can show me a graph that shows me that Korean shipbuilders are making comparable to U.S. shipbuilders, I'll show you the same stats that sit there and say that Korea has cut down their number of full-time employees and they're using casuals and part-time labor and contract labor at a much lower cost to build their ships. There's no question that American ships are going to cost more. It's the U.S. It's a cost more. I make more than probably a professor does over in the Philippines. And I guarantee you that a Philippine think tank probably doesn't pay as much as Scott's making right there. But again, this is an issue that has, I am not a national defense asset. Scott certainly isn't a national defense asset, but ships are a national defense asset. And again, we keep glossing over the national security element here. Countries. The difference really is decades and decades of being protected from competition, simply not having to innovate. No American shipyard builds ships like this that hold natural gas. Uh, we did in the 70s and 80s, we had a program through the Merchant Marine Act of 1936, which is a follow-on to the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, the Jones Act, that provided operational and construction differentials that allowed you to build ships in the U.S. and offset the cost of building in the U.S. versus overseas. And even though those ships were dedicated to international trade, by building commercial ships in U.S. shipyards, what we did was allow domestic ships in the Jones Act trade to be built at a lower cost too, because we were building ships. And that also benefited the U.S. Navy, who could use those same shipyards to build their vessels, ship repair, all of that. This is a key element that keeps getting missed. We're just looking at a thin slice of one issue when you're talking about a national maritime strategy. Because of the Jones Act, that's a big problem. New England is facing its highest energy costs in more than 25 years. This New England governor knows what to blame. The Jones Act, this antiquated 100-year-old uh, union-driven policy. So does this energy company president who wants to buy natural gas. That's down in the Gulf that we could access if we could get relief from the Jones Act. Okay, the easiest way to move natural gas into New England is by pipeline. Understand if you put it on a ship and you have to liquefy it, that costs a lot of money. You have to liquefy it, you have to haul it on a ship. The charter rates for liquefied natural gas carriers during the peak here when, when Russia cut everything off was half a million dollars a day. Uh, it's much better to pump it by a natural gas pipeline, but what we're not talking about here with John and Cato knows this very well, Scott knows this, is that New York has prohibited a natural gas pipeline feeding into New England to provide them cheap natural gas. I don't know why New York is doing it. I assume it has something to do with the Red Sox and the Patriots, but they're not doing that. And that's one of the key things. And when you get an energy company up there to sit there and say, well, you know, this is this is preventing the, the shipment of LNG to you. Okay, this is a dude who's trying to make money and he'd much rather haul natural gas on a foreign ship than have to think about putting it on an American ship. And by the way, why is it that there's not enough storage capacity in New England? Understand what, fix this, what fixes this entire situation is one ship. One ship fixes this. And I have a solution to this. I have a solution to this thing in a second. Did a whole video on it up here. All you have to do is reflag in one ship on a temporary Jones Act waiver. See, I'm not all Jones Act, you know, live or die. Flag it in, bring it into the US flag, U.S. crew, U.S. company, let it operate. It can supply New England, it can supply Puerto Rico. And in the meantime, you put a surcharge on so, so much on every million cubic feet of LNG hauled on a foreign ship. 
and you use that fund that eventually builds up to to fund a shipbuilding fund so that you can build a domestic ships in the United States. Russia has an LNG fleet. Qatar has an LNG fleet. China's building an LNG fleet. We don't. Since 2016, we've started exporting LNG because we're fracking the hell out of the United States and we're producing LNG. That's why we need to get back into this. It has huge national security interests. But again, we're glossing over that. He wants the gas. He can't get gas for the winter. Why didn't you enter into long-term contracts to ensure a reliable supply of gas or whatever fuel you needed to run your plants? Your planning is not a Jones Act problem. It's a planning problem. I did bad planning. Why can't I use the South Korean ship? A Jones Act waiver is not the way to address poor planning. Thanks to people like her, today waivers are even more restricted. You give politicians money not to grant waivers. Okay, and again, John Stossel is basically arguing that the American Maritime uh, Partnership is bribing, I guess. Again, is he just figuring out what lobbyists do? And by the way, what is Cato doing with its forums and all the things it does to lobby on the opposite side of this? But again, that, that's libertarian and that's in John's viewpoint. Hold up. <laughs> all right, let's, let's unpack this. Frankly, you know, waivers should be safe, legal, and rare. Ooh, I would not have used that phrase. What we too often see is somebody's trying to make a quick buck. There's no national defense need. There's no shortage of product. It's, hey, I could save some money. But saving money is good for consumers. It's good for everyone, except America's shipping monopoly. Uh, let's be clear. You're not saving money for everyone because there is no guarantee you rip off the Jones Act and tomorrow unicorns and rainbows, everything is better because that's what they prophesize right here. That's not what you're going to get. Instead, what you're going to get is unreliable service. We've seen that happen during the supply chain crisis. And you're going to see ships divert to different areas when the trade beckons it and they can get better rates. Why is there a diesel shortage in New York and the Mid Atlantic and uh, New England Mid Atlantic region is because they're hauling diesel fuel out of that region to haul to Europe to basically offset the loss of diesel coming from Russia. We've seen it over and over again. They don't want competition. No. Of course, most industries don't. Don't sell the tough American short. American car makers didn't want competition. They worried as foreign cars won American consumers. It's no secret a lot of people believe American cars aren't built as well as Japanese or European cars. Because American automakers were forced to compete with Volkswagen, Honda, Toyota, they stepped up their game. No one can say our cars don't stack up. Just okay, uh, just a quick little reminder here. Uh, am I incorrect in remembering the fact that the U.S. government bailed out Chrysler because it was going bankrupt? And on average, how many cars do Americans own versus, I don't know, super tankers? Uh, it's a complete apples and oranges comparison right here. The big three automakers dominated the industry. We literally almost invented cars in the United States. They dominated the industry. Yeah, they had to adjust when foreign cars came in, but there was a lot of legislation that offsets that. We subsidize highways. We make sure that taxes are low on gas and diesel compared to other countries around the world. We promote basically independent cars and trucks in the United States. And before you jump to aviation, let's remember there's two companies that dominate aviation. That's Boeing and that's Airbus. And that's it. There's 91% of all aircraft are built by those two. So again, you're comparing the largest objects built by human ships with a gremlin. Okay, that's a great argument. Just like foreign competition improved American automobiles, foreign competition would do the same for American-made ships. And again, those of you who oppose the Jones Act, I recommend you go to the Philippines and get yourself several think tanks to offset the cost that you're paying right now to the Cato Institute, because for five years since 2018, they really haven't done much to repeal the Jones Act. You're not getting your money's worth. You can get a lot more think tanks if you farm it out overseas. That's basically what Scott's talking about. He's right. Competition works. The Jones Act should die. We'd all be better off if America's shipping industry had to compete. 
except if you are in the US military and find yourself overseas somewhere and you're waiting on resupply and now all of a sudden there's not a US ship, there's not a US crew to man those vessels because we've cut the Jones Act, we've cut US mariners out, there's no infrastructure to repair ships in the United States anymore. Because understand what happens when you repeal the Jones Act is tomorrow every US flagship goes away in the domestic trade. All of them, all of them go away. And now all of a sudden you'll have cruise ships cruising up and down the United States and cargo ships cruising up and down the United States, planting themselves within the trade, competing against U.S. workers and U.S. truck drivers and rail and everyone. Because again, you don't have to abide by U.S. labor standards. You don't have to abide by U.S. labor laws because they're on sovereign territory. They're flying the flag of a nation and therefore their rules apply, not your rules. That's the issue they have. And I love John Stossel. I've watched him for a long time. I think he does some great reports, but I think he is misplaced on this one. <sighs> Hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a thumbs up, and if you can, support the page because I don't receive a subsidy and I am not a paid lobbyist or being paid by those who oppose a lobby. I am a tenured professor uh, at Campbell University who's running a YouTube page to uh, uh, get out this information and make a little money on the side. If you can, support the page. How? You can hit that super thanks button down below. John, go ahead. I know you want to do it. Or go over to Patreon. Scott, you can do this. Go over to Patreon and become a monthly or yearly subscriber. Until the next video, this is Sal signing off.